Hello, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be joining you today, and uh, I hope you find this discussion to be helpful to your work. Um, I would say I did recognize one or two names um, of people who attended a similar workshop that I participated in not that long ago. So apologies to you all if these stories are very familiar. Um, if it seems a little bit repetitive, I'll try to sprinkle in some additional details, maybe some jokes to make the story seem uh, more interesting or compelling uh, this time. Um, so I want to actually share a bit about my background, my professional background, because it's actually relevant for my, my own take as someone uh, who does needs assessments a lot in my work. Um, and I want to share a bit about my professional background, in particular, how I engage with issues relating to uh, science and sometimes science and technology. It may not be identical or uh, overlapping in the same way that you all would do it in, in your work. Um, but I think it's relevant um, because it shows kind of the challenges of incorporating a kind of a multidisciplinary approach to programming when you're working with stuff that's touching on uh, STEM issues. So my background is actually uh, in the social sciences more than like uh, uh, natural sciences or things relating to science and technology. And for many years, uh, I was a professor in the university here in the United States. And I taught um, a lot of subjects relating to conflict resolution. Um, and international relations. So I both taught people how to kind of deal with resolving conflict on an interpersonal level, kind of as a skills-based phenomenon, but also looked at, um, you know, dealing with conflicts on a kind of a society level. So in countries where there had been war and conflict and they were rebuilding, um, you know, after the signing of a peace agreement or um, if the United Nations or other forces um, came in to kind of enforce a, a ceasefire or a peace treaty. So after working for uh, several years as a professor, I became involved in applied education and programming uh, related to these kinds of initiatives. So training members of the United States State Department or US Agency for International Development who were um, helping local communities to build peace after war and conflict and what that meant in practice. And then also working with civil society groups like educators, medical professionals, uh, people working in psychosocial field who are also involved in conflict resolution and looking at sort of where the theory behind best practices met, uh, met in the real world um, the challenges uh, of everyday implementation of a program. So it was at this point, actually, that my introduction to the current work that I do at World Learning, which is monitoring and evaluation began. And also, it was at this point in my career where the introduction to working at the intersection of applied science began, and it's for two reasons. So the first, monitoring and evaluation was simply because as someone who was beholden to donors, in some cases like sponsors, like corporations or philanthropies, or in other instances, donors were governments like the United States government or uh, the Canadian government or the European Union or the government of Japan. They were saying, we will provide funding for these programs that you're doing, um, but you have to make an effort to show why it's worthwhile. and whether or not this program is actually working. So in addition to designing the programming, I had to actually show that it was working, that it was having an effect. And there are some things, for example, when you're teaching concrete things like in science or math, you can very easily show whether or not teachers have learned a new skill or whether students have learned a new skill. But when you're dealing with sort of more diffuse or abstract concepts, it's often more difficult to show whether or not people are actually learning it and applying it in their work after you've conducted trainings for them. So I became um, really quite uh, adept at trying to show how um, you know, new concepts that I was teaching about were actually learned and actually used in, in work and that were having an effect. So that kind of began my 
introduction to monitoring and evaluation. Because at World Learning, we do a lot of educational interventions all over the world. You know, trying to teach people, or children in some instances, adults, new knowledge and skills. And really the challenge is not so much developing this curriculum to begin with or STEM related, but uh, were we actually successful in our goals? Like not only did we train people, but did, did they use what we learned, we taught them, um, or was it actually something that they came away with kind of as a transformative experience? So that's kind of the first part of how I went from being a teacher and designing curricula and designing trainings to someone who tried to measure the results of those trainings. And the second thing that actually happened in the course of my career was my engagement with science. And that's actually more of a roundabout discussion, but I think as you all, as people who are interested in STEM, or might find it interesting. So one of the things that um, I encountered in a lot of places where I was working, where there had been conflict and violence, was that people were uh, dealing with profound stressors, right? So we often designed very interesting educational programs related to conflict resolution and violence prevention, but we noticed that the, the programming seemed to kind of plateau in the sense that uh, it reached people, it reached certain populations, they understood the content, but we were not able to get past a certain point of effectiveness in our kind of goals of the programming. And one of the things that I was really interested in is why, if we've developed sort of cutting edge programming and training, we've developed ways to train trainers, we've developed ways for different youth, uh, different people from different ages to understand and apply the concepts, why would it plateau? I'm using that term like to talk about a hill, like why is it that at, at a certain point people aren't learning and in fact, the outcomes are diminishing. And that kind of led me to science. And so here's where my, my background kind of overlaps with Dr. Abdulaziz, who spoke earlier. And I became really interested in cognitive neuroscience and also what's called the neurobiology of stress. So basically understanding our brains and how we learn and what's going on in the learning process. And also what's the relationship between the mind and the body when people are under profound stress and how that might affect learning outcomes. And the reason I was thinking about these issues is because I was working in countries where there was war and conflict, where there was people were under a lot of stress. And one of the things that I had looked at, kind of evidence-based approaches, kind of science-based approaches, was to see that like it is natural when people are under profound stress that their ability to learn new things and apply new skills would be diminished or be affected. So that maybe it would be a way to actually enhance the learning goals that I was working on was to combine the science-based approach and the understanding of how our brains work and how our brains and bodies work together, particularly when we're under stress, right, or if we're under experiencing things like traumatic stress, and actually align that or combine that with the new skills I was trying to teach. So I'm happy to say that I was successful after several years of study and applied learning. We were able to do that to kind of bring these two things together. Um, and it was a real challenge because on the one hand, it meant bringing people together to learn about STEM related concepts and also bring people together in an educational context uh, to do applied learning and a way to kind of synchronize or align those things and still measure results to see that, that we were effective. So that is sort of like my introduction to kind of like developing things as an educator, um, you know, do it, doing applied learning, uh, trying to measure results. And then also to try to bring in cutting edge concepts from science and technology, all in a way that made sense to people. And in my case, where people were uh, in, in, under profound stress and so had difficulties of learning. So like I want to actually kind of use all of this, my own, my background experience to kind of uh, as an introduction to the idea of needs assessments, and, you know, why that's important um, because I learned the hard way so to speak, I mean, we made a lot of how what we had uh, was a steep learning curve in the sense that like made some errors um, doing needs assessment. And because I made those errors, I kind of learned what to do and what not to do. So let me kind of kind of share that with a kind of a sense of humility as we kind of start, start the discussion about, you know, what are needs assessment and how that might relate to STEM. So Haley, if you could advance the next slide, please. Sorry, my screen is, can, all right, thanks. So 
Um, needs assessment, uh, you know, it sounds kind of a little strange sometimes, particularly for people who English isn't their first language, but it's, it's actually a very basic idea, which is basically doing your due diligence or doing your homework to figure out that like what you are designing for a program is in fact what the people who you're trying to help need. And that, that implies a kind of a, a dialogue, right? And applies, uh, uh, implies that you are uh, committed to um, uh, inclusive practices where you're reaching out to people in a kind of a, a spirit of uh, good nature and equality and saying to them, you know, I'm coming in with someone with uh, expert knowledge and skills that I'd like to teach you, but I'm coming in also with a, a desire as to speak with you as an equal and not just someone who's going to tell you what to do, right? Um, so uh, this is, in many instances, counterintuitive to a lot of professionals and a lot of experts and specialists around the world. Um, because many people will say, well, I studied for many years a subject, for example, in STEM or science and technology or in other things. I'm the expert. Uh, and if people want to hear from me, they should listen to what I have to say. Uh, and that means kind of acknowledging my expertise and doing what I have to say. And I would say that we want to kind of move away from that perspective uh, and move more toward a kind of humble perspective to say that there's a, a fine line between sharing your expertise with someone and recognizing that they want to learn from you and simply dictating to others that you alone know what to do, right? Um, so in theory, we should be able to do that, but sometimes that doesn't always happen. So we just have to kind of be frank about that from, from, the, from the beginning of the discussion. So this means that when we're setting up something like a STEM center or setting up any applied programming for people, that we need to involve the stakeholders in the process, right? And sometimes that's a very basic question is saying like, hi, we uh, were told that in your community, you'd be interested in setting up a STEM center. Is that the case, right? Um, were the people that we spoke to uh, accurately representing the community? Um, and is it the case that you want our help? In most instances, they'll say yes, but you know what? I have heard uh, of cases where people say, you know what, we don't actually want your help and we don't want this resource here. However, you might be more successful if you move to the community to the, in a different neighborhood or in a different town, right? So like in that sense, it's important from the very beginning to uh, involve stakeholders in the process, right? Um, because we often say you don't know what you don't know, right? Um, and you have that technical knowledge, right? But we have to think about the other things that are important, which are the, the experiences of the people in the community and the knowledge of what is best fitted for their community, right? So you want to involve the stakeholders in the process. You want to ask thoughtful questions to the stakeholder, right? So why do I say that? Well, I have known of instances where some people have said, okay, we'll involve the stakeholders in the process, but it's just really a very superficial way of involving them, right? So it's basically kind of, I use this analogy of parachuting in, right? Saying like you have kind of arrive out of the blue from the plane, right? Sort of come in, outside the community and just show up one day and say like, okay, uh, I'm involving you in the process to set up this STEM center and here are some questions. Do you, do you know how to do this? Yes or no. You know, do you have people that teach about science and technology? Yes or no. You know, do you have the uh, resources for us to set up a, a STEM center, like a building? You know, uh, do you have Wi-Fi cap capabilities? Like, do people have access to technology that they can use? You know, tablet devices, computers, yes or no, right? So, you know, a survey in which you ask people this kind of information is important. It's important in, in getting information about the practical things that would be needed to set up something like a STEM center. But it's not necessarily thoughtful questions. If it's just sort of a binary process where you're asking them yes or no, and you're just kind of viewing them instrumentally as providing you information you need to do something, but you're not viewing them as a partner, right? So this is something that's really important to think about from the outset, if, because 
I'm sorry to say in many instances, it's simply not done. Right? And so like this relates to kind of the last point that I have, which is saying, once you've asked thoughtful questions of the stakeholders, the people that you're, you're working with, you're using their answers and their knowledge, right? And their resources in your efforts to help them, right? So this is a very different approach in the sense that, like it's saying, I am asking you questions uh, because I want to get important information about what it would mean practically to set up this program. But I'm, I'm doing it from a point of view where I recognize that I'm your partner and I ultimately, you know, your community better than my, than I do. And so maybe, uh, while I have maybe technical expertise about setting up 1 of these programs, there's a lot of things that I don't know. And that I don't know that I don't know, meaning kind of from a larger point of view that I haven't even thought about. Right? Which are really important. Right? So. I'll give kind of two examples uh, where things happen to me uh, professionally or uh, kind of a personal story, but I think is really significant um, because there is a sometimes a kind of a prejudice around science and around issues related to STEM to sort of think like STEM is really awesome, STEM is really great. Um, you know, science based approaches to education are cutting edge and are extremely important, right? But um, and all those things are true, right? But the needs assessment and the kind of approaching people on the basis of equal is equally important, right? So we can't sort of take the uh, the misnomer or the false idea that just because it's STEM based that we can do whatever we want, right? Because um, you know that would be um, that would be a real error, right? It would be an error in terms of best practices, and it would and it would be probably an error ethically as well. So I will give. And one example where there was just a total needs assessment failure, right, um, on, a, on a program that I was involved with, and then kind of a case where I was shocked to hear about it coming from uh, an expert. So about three years ago, I was invited to Ottawa, the capital of Canada, for uh, an expert training. So as I told you, I'm, I work a lot on uh, violence prevention issues. And uh, the host of the, of the conference invited people from all over the world to come to Ottawa for uh, three days for an expert training. And their thinking was, if we identify people from all over the world and we bring them in for this training and we give them this new knowledge, which is in many instances informed by technology that we've developed and we train them in them, we give them new school, we give them new skills, new tools, then they can go back to their homes all around the world and we've done our job perfectly, right? And so like the assessment that they did was to identify the professionals from around the world who would benefit from the new curriculum that they designed, bring them to Canada for three days and then do the training. So like from a logistical point of view, that was a lot because they had to identify people, write them, uh, buy plane tickets for them to fly, get lodging for them and then house them in a, hotel conference center for three days and, you know, do workshops to do the training. So in that sense, their needs assessment was really excellent because they identified principles, they identified how to get them to Canada. They developed a toolkit for people, right? Which they did, they tested and they developed things for people to take home with them. But in execution, they, they made major mistakes. Why, right? Because they simply assumed that Part of the needs assessment was bringing people to, 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 to Ottawa for three days and doing a training. But they didn't think beyond that, right? So what happened was uh, in practical execution, there were real issues with food, right? They brought in people from all over the world who had different uh, dietary needs based on culture and religion, other things, right? So some people were very strictly vegetarian. They came from countries where, uh, where there was a personal choice to be vegetarian, right? Others in the group said that they had food allergies um, to things like nuts, right? Others came from uh, places where, because of their religion, they didn't eat pork for like halal or kosher reasons. So they wouldn't eat pork or anything that was touching pork. And the people who planned the meals for the conference, so all the meals for the conference were provided by the, uh, the sponsors, didn't think of that, right? So they just had like a large uh, buffet style of meals, right? But it was like, it wasn't halal, it was pork and things. 
there wasn't a realistic vegetarian option. And like the things that were vegetarian had nuts, like pine nuts or other nuts in it. So all the people with food allergies couldn't handle it. So there started to be a real um, system of chaos that happened because people couldn't eat, right? So that they couldn't eat and there was a kind of a shortage of food or like the people who were vegetarians or keeping halal were all, you know, eating what they could first. And, there, and so they ran out of food. And so the sponsors had to scramble to provide food for everyone. And you say like, well, why is that significant? It's significant because their need assessment was precedent on the idea that if you just bring people and you feed them and then they can listen to the new trainings, but people were missing their meals for a day and a half. So they were grumpy, they were upset, they had to do things on the fly. And the all the learning outcomes of the training were, were, were severely affected, right? Now they did eventually sort it out and gave people stipends to buy food and brought in other things, but by that time the training was half over, right? And as I noted, I think once, even today, if I talk to colleagues from around the world who I met in this conference, and I said, if we mention this conference, people don't remember what they learned. <laughs> they remember that they ran out of food or that the food issue was bad, that the needs assessment was done for. So because they, they missed this crucial point Right, they essentially were not able to achieve their goals. Right, and even though from a technical point of view, everything that they had created was outstanding, and I use that in my work, in this sense, they really made a major error. And the other issue that I wanted to kind of talk about, which is I think very much relating to the STEM, uh, is a story that a, a friend of mine who uh, saw a, a doctor relayed with me. And um, the friend went to her uh, physician, like her general practitioner, and she had uh, an, an issue where she needed to see a specialist uh, because of her because of her health. Um, so she, uh, I think the issue was that she had like migraine headaches or migraine headaches, as they're called. And so her her doctor referred her to a specialist who said, um, okay, she said, met the specialist who said, I have migraines. And the, and the specialist said, okay, I take, take take this medication, this will, will work for your headache. And uh, she said, well, I don't, I didn't talk to you about the, 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 what happens when I get the headaches, or where they begin. I didn't, I didn't talk to you about how long I'd had the problem. I didn't talk to you um, a, a, about the intensity of the pain. I didn't talk to you about, um, you know, any reactions that I may get from certain kinds of medications, because I have related effects, you know, like I have some, gastrointestinal issues, so I can't take certain medications, which will inflame those organs in my body. And the, and the, and the doctor's like, look, I, I'm the expert. Uh, you came to me, you, you told me you had this thing. I'm telling you this, this medication will work. You, here's a prescription. You know, I don't understand why you're arguing with me. I, I'm a specialist, you know, I, I'm involved in this, trust me. Um, so this is another case where like, it's a total, uh, failure of a needs assessment. And, you know, it's arrogance of a, of a doctor to say, well, like I'm the specialist and I know what I'm doing and you should just do it, right? But there is sometimes this presumption where people will think they can do that as a specialist, right? Um, and I, what I would say is there's a difference where if you have a physician who says like, look, I have treated, you know, hundreds of people over the course of my uh, career and I have a lot of knowledge Right, and that informs my knowledge, so I have a general sense of what I need to do, versus uh, saying like just do what I say, right? right? And that goes back to what I was talking about about an inclusive process. Right? Now, I don't mean to be pedantic or patronizing, but I'm but I'm saying that like sometimes with the best of intentions, when we're setting up these programs, the same type of thing happens, right? Where we say like okay, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you, but in reality, um, we're not really involving the stakeholders in the process, right? We're just assuming we know better than them, right? And like from our point of view at World Learning, uh, that's both unethical, but it's also in terms of best practices, not a good idea because you won't succeed to the best of your ability. You won't actually get the outcomes you want. So with that, um, I wanted to actually kind of share to uh, a, a resource that we have uh, for you, if you could advance to the next slide. 
this is, so we have actually a, a toolkit for uh, our world learning has set up um, related to kind of best practices and setting up a STEM center. So I think we, if you haven't seen this toolkit already, we can send you the link either in an email or at the end of this presentation, or you can find it online. And we have done a lot of the, the legwork or the initial steps that are necessary uh, you know, for doing a, a needs assessment in the sense of we've developed questionnaires um, that are really important for you know, dealing with members of the community. So one of the things that I, I spoke about earlier when we we're talking about um, needs assessments and doing kind of meaningful interactions with people, right? It's like you can develop questionnaires, but you can also, it's very important to have uh, open-ended questions, right? So in the sense that you ask people specific questions about what they need, but you're also giving them the space to provide answers which, when you haven't touched upon the important things in your, in your question. So we actually have examples of needs assessments in this toolkit, which you might use, right? One is, for example, of working with youth or younger people about what they think they might need in terms of a STEM center and what, what would be resources and knowledge that they need. And there's another questionnaire that's there for dealing with uh, people who are older in the community. So that could either be the parents of the youth that you're working with or with other learned adults in the community. So it could be teachers, school administrators, like headmasters, principals, or other really key stakeholders in the community who you want to talk to. So we designed um, uh, the needs assessment questionnaires in a way that's uh, recommended. So I would say you could use that as a template as a beginning point and then customize it and tailor it to your own community, community where you might be working with. But another uh, tool that we um, use and that we, uh, we recommend is, is this, and it's called a SWOT analysis. Now SWOT is an acronym, um, but this is, and that stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And SWOT analysis is actually an interesting tool because it was developed uh, by businesses, right? So a lot of people who are involved in uh, setting up new businesses or even people who are um, venture capitalists, for example, people who want to provide uh, funding for a startup initiative, like a tech startup, or for example, a lot of the global tech centers in the world, they, they don't get venture capital like to set up a new initiative uh, to do some. So when, when people in the business community are interested in doing a needs assessment, in addition to kind of asking the thoughtful questions, which we talked about, they often do the SWOT analysis. And it's helpful because it's this grid, right? So you actually kind of use this uh, grid and you write your answers in the grid and you can look at your responses side by side and do a comparative analysis. I have done it in some instances with work that I was doing, um, particularly when I had to do a rapid startup of something, right? So if you're doing something and you have a very limited time to really think about a needs assessment, like 30 days, a SWOT analysis is helpful to kind of, if you to get all the information on one page and look at it and process it. So at the top half of the grid, we see on the left side, it says internal origin, right? So what internal origin means is basically those are the things that are relating to you or your organization that are conducting the needs assessment, right? So you as an individual, your partners, your colleagues, right? Those are that are those are things that are um, that you are bringing to the equation. You are bringing to the situation that you need to think about yourself, yourself being in a in the collective sense as well. So when we see strengths, the S in the acronym that says helpful to achieving the objective. So you basically identify what are all the things that you bring to the needs assessment of setting up a STEM center that are helpful, right? Um, so in some instances, that's, you know, the technical expertise, right? Knowledge of how to do it, the reputation of having done it in other contexts, um, having a reputation of professional excellence, even if you've never done it before. But what are those things that you bring that when other people hear about it are a strength, a major strength, right? It could be things like you're trusted, right? You are known, a known commodity, a known actor in a community. It could be 
things like if they do an internet search about you or your colleagues, they will find favorable things. So those are all things that you, you identify about yourself, um, which is gonna frame um, you know, your needs assessed. Uh, and the next part of the grid, you see W for weaknesses, and it says harmful to achieving those objectives. So those are things that you have to have an honest conversation um, with yourself and your colleagues about things that, that, that you have attributes that may actually undermine or bring great difficulty to conducting a new assessment, right? In my case, a lot of the work that I did um, internationally as well as in the United States in my own country, the harmful things were being perceived as, a, as an outsider, right? So in some instances, people very much respected uh, the technical expertise that I had or my willingness to help. But in other instances, being an outsider, someone from outside the community was a deterrent, uh, was something that people uh, viewed somewhat distrustful, right? You have to be honest with yourself because that allows you to identify things that might particularly remedy that weakness. So like if I know that I'm an outsider, then I will partner with someone internally to give me credibility, right? For example, like that. So that's precisely what you have to do, you know, to give someone to uh, what we call a gatekeeper, to someone to open the doors to members of the community to you, right? But you could identify anything, right? Um, so, and that is really important to have an honest conversation uh, really with yourself or your team about what what are things that are hindrances in your own self. So at the lower part of the grid, we see uh, O and T, opportunities and threats, and we see that it says external origin. So those are factors really relating to the community that you're working with or the environment that you're working with that you don't much control, um, but can very much affect the success of your initiative, right? So opportunities usually means, right, that people want your help, that people are interested in partnering with you, that they recognize the value of what you're doing, um, that people in some instances may have, have written to you beforehand, have reached out to you or your organization and asked for your help. That's really a very important. Uh, other things are, it could be, in, you could be investing your time in a community where there's broad interest in STEM. Uh, in a country or community where, you know, the people are known to be interested. So they would be very much receptive to the message, right? So those are things that you have to identify. You can't just assume that people love STEM and they want to work with you, but if you know after doing some information gathering that they are, then you can, you know, uh, say that that's an opportunity. Now, what is a threat, right? Here I'm not talking about a threat necessarily as a physical threat, like someone is, is, has threatened to harm you or says, if you come into our community, you know, we'll beat you up physically. Well, obviously that's a threat, but here we're actually talking more of a threat in kind of a psychological sense. And sometimes we are threats to people and we have to be honest about that. Like if you're bringing in new skills, new training, and there's already someone in the community who's doing that, then you are, you may be perceived as a threat, as undermining your credibility or undermining your expertise, right? Because even if you say, we don't mean to harm your reputation or to in any way affect your ability to train others in STEM, they might perceive you as doing it anyway. And if they perceive you as doing it anyways, they could do things within the community to undermine you or affect you in a negative way. We have to, to be to be honest about that because we're dealing with human beings and human beings sometimes are threatened by others who have comparable expertise or knowledge. So one way to kind of mitigate that threat is to identify who might be or which organizations might be threatened by you or perceive you as a threat and reach out to them beforehand, propose partnerships, propose working with them, co-opting them, in some instances you can do that, but you have to think about that. So in my own work, I have found that in resource poor communities where there's usually one group, school, uh, private sector person who primarily dominates the market or service providing activity, this is common and you have to uh, plan for that. So kind of a SWOT analysis, 
is really helpful needs assessment tool that we recommend you use. You don't have to use it, but it's just kind of helpful. If you develop your own means as well, one thing that can be really helpful to do is to do what you think is important and then just as an intellectual exercise, do this flawed analysis as well. So that kind of concludes what I wanted to, to share my ideas about needs assessment. Uh, I wanted to open up to uh, questions. Uh, I have some questions for you if, if you're all feeling shy, but I just figured start, uh, you know, opening up questions to you first. And uh, if you're if people are reluctant to speak, we can go to my questions, but that's not necessary. So please, by all means, uh, if you want to share your comments, uh, if you agree or disagree with what I have to say or whatever, please, um, I'm happy to to uh, comment as best as I can. All right, since we're not I'm having some people have messaged me saying thank you for the useful ideas. Okay, great. Um, so uh, someone said, what are some additional steps that you feel are crucial when carrying out a needs assessment besides the SWOT analysis? Um, that's good. I think uh, one thing that's really important behind besides the SWOT analysis is to always have kind of strategy sessions with partners, right? So, um, whomever you're partnering with in the community, right? Uh, whoever is kind of the technical lead or kind of the point of contact for the local community to do strategy sessions with them. So that could be involving them in the SWOT analysis, but always really from the from the beginning of the process to kind of get their perspective. One of the things that that I Thinks important is to, as I said, be aware, kind of mapping the terrain, so to speak. So sometimes, from a technical point of view, we can be aware of all the practicalities that are important. Like for example, um, you know what's what's important in terms of you know having uh, the right technology, the right electrical grid, uh, you know the right uh, 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 equipment. Right, but then there there are other factors at play. So, um, like those strategy sessions are are really are really key. I have worked as a, as a kind of a technical specialist or a technical advisor, and I often understand about the practical issues related to like new knowledge and skills. But there's often just many factors on the local community level that I I'm not aware of, and I wouldn't be aware of just as being a, as a new person to a situation. So. Those kind of strategy sessions were very important. Um, someone said, can I ask a question by Mike? So I will defer to Haley if that's possible. That's fine with me. Um, yeah, go ahead, Adeline. Thanks. I was just trying to formulate my question into a quick chat message and couldn't figure it out. Um, I think. I completely understand and agree with the importance of having meaningful needs assessment uh, in the development of a project. I think, as I see it, one challenge is that if a project is truly new, um, 
the, the potential stakeholders don't necessarily know you so well. And it takes quite a lot of time to give meaningful feedback about what your needs are. So I'm curious about if you have any comments or tips about um, getting people to fill out a, or, or, or to enter, take the time to have that conversation with you or fill out a detailed survey or something like that, because it does take quite a lot of investment. And if you're just newly starting a program, they don't necessarily know what they might get out of filling out that information or what the what the return might be on that. Cool. That's an excellent question and you and kind of relates to the questions to consider that I shared. Basically, it has to be an, an iterative process, a continuing process. So the best laid plans often unravel. So you could do a meaningful needs assessment with a good proportion of the community and get their feedback. And then what will happen is a few weeks into the process, other people will contact you and say, we weren't consulted or, or there's important information that you missed, or this was a new project and we didn't consider this, this at the time. And all of a sudden we're thinking of new things. So basically the way to deal with that is to think of a needs assessment as, as not a one time bound process, but something that that's continually recurring throughout the life cycle of a project. And to try to get that information as as much as you can and frequently as you can and still be inclusive. But that's entirely true. Um, one of the things that you could do if you're starting a new project is is to give that caveat to the people that do agree to participate in a needs assessment and say, like, hey, we've we understand this is new and we understand that because it's new, things will come up. Uh, can we reach back to you in six weeks' time? Would you be willing to help us find people in the community as we uh, roll out the project so that we can continue to ask these kind of questions, right? That way you're not limiting yourself and you're still being inclusive in the process, right? So the way to address it, it, it as much as it's possible is to think about it um, in that way. Um, so a lot of times we talk about like a continuous adapting the project, right? So an analogy could be like from music, if you think about like a symphony orchestra versus a jazz quartet. So like a, an orchestra has a score, a set composition, and the composer leads and the musicians follow the, you know, the musical composition, almost like a script. But the jazz um, music um, is spontaneous and adaptive, right? So the musicians have to know how to play instruments for sure. But each time that they play with each other, they do it slightly different. So in this sense, like if you're doing a new project and you know that you'll have to maybe adjust midstream, you can prepare that way. And being honest and open with people about a new project and needing continued feedback is a way to do it. And that's usually best done if you have established relationships with people that you trust. Um, so someone asked, uh, uh, have you ever had an experience in which needs assessment had to be readjusted? Yes, uh, um, I was involved in a large project which had to be readjusted three times because it was a pilot program using new knowledge and skills that had never been applied in the country before. Uh, and so since we planned that we would have to adjust, we used a methodology called a developmental evaluation, uh, which is basically how do you do series of needs assessments over the course of a project to adjust, right? So like that's the way um, you know, that we did it. Um, so someone asked, said needs assessment is a political term. Um, you know, uh, and that's absolutely true. Um, you know, some, yeah, so sometimes someone will say, uh, you know, who are, you know, who, who's, who's determining the need? Is it the community? Is it the trainer? Is it the, the person who's supplying the money, the, the organization that's supplying the money? And I, I will be honest, it's a, it's a political term, yes. In many instances, the best way to try to deal with it, in my belief, is to still try to be as inclusive as possible. Acknowledge if others push back or object, you know, say like, okay, I, I would like you to inform what we're doing here. Uh, and it, But, I mean, that's a, that's a reality. Um, if you are uh, 
if you are working in a kind of a large complex project and the, the donor is, uh, you know, government or an international organization or a company or philanthropy, they, they will usually expect you to do something like this, but you should endeavor to be as inclusive, inclusive as possible. I find that in most instances, if you try, there is goodwill toward you. And most importantly, if you try to do this, if the people you're trying to help identify a major gap or a major flaw or a major problem, they will come to you with enough time so that you can address it and adapt accordingly. Any other questions? Peter, I think there's one from Binod. I don't know if you can see Sorry. Sorry, I'm not able to hear. There's an echo. Sorry. I can read it for you, Peter, if you'd like. Sure, sure. So Binod writes, the needs assessment is always a political term. Whose needs I guess, are we assessing? Sometimes we call it the needs of, of community members, but researchers, trainers also justify their needs. And how do you become aware when you're working with such cases? So excellent, excellent question. What I try to do in that is try to be as inclusive as possible when conducting a needs assessment, right? So sometimes people will say, I represent the community because I am the mayor of the town or I am the you know, major political leader. So you just need to consult me or my advisors. And their voice is important, but they don't necessarily represent everyone in the community. Someone might say, I'm the headmaster of the school or I'm the principal of the school. You can just speak with me and I will give you a sense of what the students or the faculty or the teachers need. Uh, and while I think it's important to speak with those kind of persons of influence in the community, one, to conduct a, a good needs assessment, do not only need to speak with them. So what I've done in my work is to sometimes have focus groups or groups to try to be as inclusive as possible to get other people. So in some instances, you have uh, meetings with youth only, right? Uh, in some communities where they're uh, conservative socially, I would have different meetings between uh, women and men because in some instances, people wouldn't feel comfortable in a mixed gender group. Uh, in some instances, youth wouldn't feel comfortable speaking up, up about what are important uh, things in their community if they were in a meeting with a, an elder or a teacher or someone who was viewed as being uh, of a hierarchically higher position than them. So the way to, to try to deal with those issues, which can be very political, is to to have enough meetings that are thoughtfully conducted and giving people access to you uh, so that their voice is important. If you are uh, doing building a STEM center in a marginalized community, a resource poor community, right, where people don't have access to a lot of, uh, of material things, including technology, uh, you would have to think about how you go to them to get their input. For example, if you're using a, a web-based survey, right, and you're expecting people to fill out a web-based survey and, and they don't have the functionality to do that, they don't have a, a smart device or a smartphone, then you would need to go to communities where, you know, like you're bringing laptops or you're bringing uh, iPads and saying, here, you know, please fill out the survey here. Or we're meeting at the library at the school and if you come at this time, you know, we can uh, you know, meet with you personally, or you can have access to this um, technology to answer the, the survey results or participate in a, in a virtual discussion, right? So the presumption in a lot of instances about being inclusive is just like if you, if you make a web survey or if you hold something online that people will have access to it, but they, but many instances they don't. Uh, so you, if you realize that you're trying to reach people who you know don't have access, either to technology or other things, then you need to go to them, right? You need to like have meetings in their communities, right? Um, you know, not just say like, oh, you know, come to this, 
you know, this building in the, in the, in the center of town or come to this hotel or where we're meeting in the conference room. If you know that people don't have the means to do that, then you would have to uh, think about having satellite meeting, so to speak, in their community. So that is you know, a way to, to, to talk thoughtfully, think about doing the needs assessment. There's the, the functional aspect of designing uh, things where you can uh, elicit people's opinions, like through a you know, web survey or a conference or something like that. And then there's the, the practical things where you have to think about having designed it, can people actually access it? So that's, that's another aspect. But to, to speak to the political issue, yes, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, but, you know, many thoughtful programs are still done and they account for those factors. And because they account for those factors, they're probably the design the best programs anyways, because people felt that they were really consulting with them. Any other questions? Well, uh, thanks for your time and for listening to me. Um, I've included my email here. So if something comes up to you and then you want to, to ask me a question, don't hesitate to reach out and I promise to answer you as, as soon as I can. Uh, I hope you found this helpful material and I wish you luck in your endeavors.